Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. To make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we didn't expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There's no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you've hidden your face from us, have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord. Do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider... We are all your people. This week we return to the, the season of Advent, the season of, of turning our attention to the expectation and, and preparation for Christ's arrival. And the set of texts for this week have a few things in common. One thing they share is that as you, you probably noticed, both the, the passage from Mark and this one from Isaiah are arresting and severe. Here in Isaiah 64, we're arriving on the scene just after the Persian king Cyrus has defeated Babylon and let the captive Israelites return to their homeland. But what follows isn't the peace and perfect restoration that they'd been hoping for, but idolatry, conflict among themselves and with others. The prophet expresses lament and sorrow. He calls on God, desperate for God to come and act as only God can, upon sin, death, and evil, for God to act in the way that a raging fire acts, on some, some water or a, a bit of kindling, or in the way that an earthquake shatters a mountain. And then in Mark 13, we, we go up a notch. Now we're talking about not just fires burning here and mountains crumbling there, but stars and moons crashing down, the light being snuffed out from the world, a cosmos-wide rupturing of the status quo. These are both very severe, heavy texts. And on top of this, there's, there's one other thing that these texts share in Mark 13 and Isaiah 64. They each revolve in their own way around God's absence. Isaiah speaks repeatedly of God being hidden. God is hiding God's face. The world is shaking and full of terror and turmoil. And God seems to have given everyone over to the, the dissipating and wasting effects of their sin, their violence, their injustice. And then in the passage in Mark, we hear from Jesus a story of a, a house owner, a head of a family, who puts the servants in charge to wait and watch while the head of the family is absent. And remember, communication is sparse and slow. When someone goes on a journey in the ancient world, there's no phone, there's no FaceTime, no email or text. You're mostly just left waiting. A silence which is at best broken occasionally by 
brief messages. The world is full of terror and violence, confusion, destruction, and we seem to be left on our own. In all these ways, these are discomforting passages. And yet here they are, scattered across our Bible and across the story of God's people. Churches around the globe today are, are reading and reflecting on these passages, hoping to hear a word from God as we begin the season of Advent together. This is kind of strange, but I think there's something really important about it. In Churches of Christ, we haven't traditionally celebrated the season of Advent. We celebrate only four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Here in, in Lubbock, we, a, we add a fifth season, which I'm going to call dirt eating. I thought about calling it the season of dust, but that doesn't quite capture the experience of it. But we haven't traditionally celebrated the season of Advent. And of course, there is something kind of strange about saying that each year we're, we're waiting for something which has already arrived, which in fact arrived over 2,000 years ago. So why do we do this? We do this because it's important to wait. And we are terrible at waiting. It's important to focus our attention regularly, explicitly, intentionally on this fact that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to God. That God has come among us, love and fleshed in the person of Christ. And so a big part of the reason for celebrating this season where we practice waiting on Christ's arrival is that we are reminded again and again that God offers us real hope in the person of Christ. But there's another important part of this, another important reason for Advent, which comes before that one. The other prior part of what we're doing is the waiting itself. And we have a very hard time waiting. I know I do, at least. As a child, I was always desperate to know what was in each of those carefully wrapped packages under the, the tree. I almost always want to, to skip to the end of an essay, skip to the end of the story. When I'm trying to learn a new idea or language or instrument, I want to skip past all the practice and simply have the new skill. Kind of like in The Matrix, in the, the, the late 90s movie, when you're fleeing for your life and you happen upon a free and available helicopter, as we tend to do, all you need to do is call your IT person, have them upload the, the helicopter flying program into your brain, and you can avoid all of the aggravating all of the aggravation of slowly learning something in the normal way. All the repetition, practice, slow progress. We want satisfaction. We want our desires to be fulfilled. We want that fulfillment immediately. So much so that we often would rather accept something artificial and inferior. Something we know, in some sense, is only moderately satisfying but which is right in front of us. We'd often rather do that than have to endure waiting for something better, more lasting. We're terrible at waiting. This is why we need to practice each year. But in Advent, we're talking about something different, a deeper kind of waiting, a waiting with our lives, with our hearts, with our deepest loves. Anytime you say that you're waiting for something, you're also saying that it hasn't arrived yet. No one hopes or waits for what they already have. You wait for what you don't have, what's not yet present. For us to wait in the season of Advent is to, to look at our lives, our relationships, the society around us, and acknowledge explicitly and intentionally the need for something more, for a lasting hope, recognizing and acknowledging all the ways that things are not as they should be. It's not just an acknowledgement, actually. It's a refusal to be satisfied with the way things are. Admitting to ourselves that we have not yet arrived. 
in the Christian tradition, a big part of this is recognizing and naming sin. All that fractures and warps our love of God and our love of our neighbors. Recognizing that none of our systems, our institutions, our agendas, our lives, none can be the final fulfillment of God's kingdom. Even though we're constantly tempted to assign them that kind of finality, to place our absolute hope in them. And this is one of the central features of both of these texts that we have before us today. They draw our attention precisely to those things that we we don't really want to face, to those parts of ourselves that we may not want to admit are limited, fractured, twisted, in need of healing. We don't want to face these things because that would mean admitting that we are among the things in need of being melted down and shaken and transformed. That we have contributed actively and passively to the warping and twisting of things. That we've helped to make the world something other than what it should be. These things are also hard to talk about because talking about them in a, in a real way means admitting that we don't have nice, neat, simple answers to these kinds of questions. Questions like, why is there so much darkness and suffering in the world? Why does God seem absent? Why are so many people's hearts, our own included, turned so much inward toward ourselves and our own selfishness? Why is there so much inequality and unfairness in the world? These questions, these problems make us uncomfortable. And so it's tempting to look away or to maybe just assign the blame solely to others or maybe just to give them simple answers so that we don't really have to think too much about it. However, there are no simple and easy answers when you're talking to someone who's afflicted with ongoing and inescapable pain of one kind or another, or someone who's slowly forgetting their loved ones in their own lives, or someone whose son or daughter or father or mother has been taken or killed. In other words, part of the task of waiting is real lament, crying out to God, expressing our own pain and anguish and fear, and also expressing our complicity in the world's pain. All of this belongs here in this time of waiting. And notice one other thing about these texts, that in both of them, most of the attention is not on some outsider, the enemies of God's people, but those who consider themselves the servants, the door watchers in God's house, those whose lives are filled with, quote, righteous deeds, as Isaiah says. But as another prophet, Amos, points out about the, even the worship of the Israelites, that under certain circumstances, even that worship counts for less than nothing. It's an offensive noise because it's really just a veil covering monstrous and unjust lives. Or as Isaiah puts it in, in this text in chapter 64, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Are they filthy rags because they didn't put Christ in Christmas? No. The striking thing in these texts is that they're focused on those who do say all the, quote, right things at all the, the right times. They prayed all the right prayers. They sang all the right songs. They offered all the right sacrifices. They performed every one of the, the required, quote, righteous deeds. But underneath that crust of, of righteous rule following were hearts of stone. Hearts and lives inclined toward love and worship of self, really, rather than the love of God and neighbor. In Jesus' parable, they were in the position of caring for the house, but they fell asleep on the job. So what does it mean to wait, then, to take care of the house, to watch at the door? It's not really about being afraid. It's also not really about saying the right things, praying the right prayers, singing the right songs. The, the outward righteous actions can overflow from a heart that's turned toward God and our neighbors. 
But those same outwardly righteous actions can just as easily be a kind of facade, a superficial covering that we use to hide our our viciousness from others or even from ourselves. So waiting has to mean something more. It's meant to be a kind of starting point deep down inside us, a framework for the way that we engage with and live out our lives the way that we make choices and form relationships and take in information, perform our jobs, interact with our coworkers, people on the other side of the political aisle. To wait and watch over the house means recognizing that it doesn't belong to us. It means actually caring for and taking care of what's most important in the house, the people all around us in a way that reflects the identity, the loving kindness of the owner of the house. So let's keep awake. Let's pray. God, we praise your holy name. You are the Holy One. We pray that you would soften, melt down our hard hearts, take away our hearts of stone, stamp within us the image of your Son, fill us with your Spirit, and transform us. Teach us to wait, to watch. Transform us more and more into your image and overflow through us your loving kindness. We pray all things through Christ our Lord. Amen.